Good morning, AI fans, and welcome to sunny San Francisco, California. We're here at Databricks Data and AI Summit. My name is Savannah Peterson, joined by a power-packed panel of analysts with me today. I've got John, Rob, and George. Thank you both for being here to start off the day. Oh, excited. <laughs> I, I mean, this, I got to say, the keynotes this morning were killer. Uh, I even loved the demo where they had a bug and they, you know, really got through it. It was. It's really a, and like you said, it's sunny out, which it's, uh, you never get here. You notice so. I made sure to mention I, I, that, especially I was, in June. Yeah, 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 it was, yeah. yeah, no June gloom, so. It's, it's, it's so sunny. There's actually coconut and island beverages, yes. also because AI is so hot right now. Uh, Such a nerdy <laughs> keynote, I have to say. George, since we haven't had the chance to share the stage before, and you brought up the topic that's on everyone's mind this morning, what are your thoughts on Databricks and their announcements around Gen AI today? Okay, so Gen AI was, I, I have to admit, like, if I had a hat, I'd have to, you know, cut it up with scissors and add some condiments and, and eat it, because 15, <laughs> 15 months ago, I said they were going to get um, squeezed by Gen AI, because they were a machine learning shop. They were built on data engineering and feature engineering, mm -hmm. and then they were trying to tack on some uh, business intelligence. I did not think um, Gen AI was going to be a whole new tool chain. And what they've done astonishingly well is pivot um, their, their tool set so that they could harness the skills of the existing personas they were with. The data scientists who were doing feature engineering and some data engineering, they now do the document chunking and creating the embeddings and the pipelines for these models. And then they put the tools they built out the mosaic tools so that it's in the notebooks that the data scientists are accustomed to. Anyway, the point is that they are harnessing a persona that they were deeply embedded with mm -hmm. so that they can harness all the energy of Gen AI and essentially up-level the data scientists to make them relevant in the era of Gen AI. And some of the folks who are coming from the business intelligence uh, world are having a little more trouble doing that. It's, it's the AI literacy and also meeting the customer where they are. Yes. And I really felt that was definitely the ethos right. of their announcement today. Yeah. Rob, you said something I adored when we were getting ready, which is, is that this is a conference for people who like to code. Yeah. It was a very nerdy keynote. We saw many lines of code. You yeah. talked about things getting debugged on stage. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think this goes and builds off of what you know, George was talking about is that there's a different persona. When you come from the data warehousing side, of, and that was kind of where they went at the end and talking about how the performance over the last four years went from over 370 seconds to set up a data warehouse to being five seconds and how they've really improved for that persona as well to bring people in. Also, they had a lot on top of Unity Catalog by bringing LLMs to be able to go and answer data questions. Now, again, that's kind of you know, bridging into that BI type landscape with the LLM. Not sure, and they talked about how they're integrating with Looker and Tableau and everything, yeah. Click and everybody else. I think you know, we'll have some of those folks on over the course of two days here, but I think that when you start to look at where they're going, it's really, they're trying to expand mm -hmm. on where they've been really strong, which is the AI, ML, data science crew, and really move into that persona much more. They talked about 7,000 companies using the data lake mm -hmm. and using uh, Which is SQL, significant, so. adoption quickly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, John, I'm really curious to get your take. You've been covering Databricks yeah. since the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. What's standing out to you this morning? I mean, this keynote, I mean, George talked about, you know, heating his hat and not thinking the Gen AI was coming, but this keynote was a story about the next Databricks. This is the evolution of Databricks. Their track record from day one with Spark was constantly popping on that next lily pad and, and getting to the next innovation. So to me, this is the story of Databricks evolving with the marketplace. Two, the second thing is, is that this was a picks and shovels show. You're seeing massive tooling, you're seeing the Delta Lake uniform, Unity Catalog, got governance. The Mosaic AI really jumped out at me too because that's saying, here, here's the tooling you need. So it's a growth market, huge demand for generative AI. They have the data lake, so it's a natural progression from them, and they're adding all the puzzle pieces. And the big thing was is that Ali Godsey really wants to push the democratization, and how he's doing that is by forcing the standard of of tables interoperability, data formats, the open data model is coming fast and I think that's going to be a standard. If this standard comes in, it might have the same impact that TCP IP had with networking, where you have a unifying moment of data where 
that will change the game. So if that happens faster, Databricks will win, and they're making the long bet there. So I'm impressed by that. So picks and shovels, trying to force the standard. Otherwise, it's going to be a fragmented market. I mean, yeah. if they don't, if it doesn't get settled, Savannah, it's going to be a fragmented data estate. He pointed that out on stage as one of the key things. So there's a lot of opportunities, but things could still go wrong, right? I mean, it could still be fragmented. It could still be competitive. We'll see how it plays out. Well, I think we're in a we're in a time where we're trying to make things go great. But to your point, we you know we talk about democratization of AI as a buzzword all the time on the show, but it's really been at the core of Databricks' efforts for the last few years. So it's not just a hype word for them; it's definitely a part of the vision. I'm curious to see how it stands out. Speaking of of not being perfect or aiming for perfect, I really enjoyed the case study of GM on the keynote this morning, yeah. and and thinking about AI again. You know, it's my favorite angle at, at how it actually touches people, everyday consumers. I just spent time with my mom this week, and she she drove up here and I love the vision, GM's vision of no collisions. And car accidents are the number one killer of, of anyone under the age of 65 in this nation uh, that isn't medically induced or, or as a result of that. So it's really interesting to think about ways we could really enhance the quality of life and be preventative using AI and have it embedded in edge devices where there's already the hardware that can make that happen sooner rather than later. GM already showing a lot of, of uh, success at scale. So, you know, I'm excited. The place is buzzing. Yeah. There yeah. are so many people here right yeah, now. It, it was, in yesterday was the first day it kind of, the floor opened up and it was packed in here. And I, I I'm think impressed what, actually. What you're seeing is, yeah. again, you know, to John, to your point and to what we talk about all the time yeah. is, there, there really is that open source feel and they talked Which about the like. 12 million yeah. lines of code they've contributed across all of the different projects and how many downloads they've had of Spark and Delta Lake and ML Flow. It's, yeah. It does have that open feeling and yes. I think Ali went at that hard. Well, in the you're going to be at the analyst session and you were at Snowflake last week. We were on the East Coast for uh, AWS events. What's the difference between Snowflake and Databricks? How do you see this keynote matching up to what Snowflake so is the, doing, George? One critical um, pivot point that started last year when Matei, the creator of Spark, got up and gave the keynote last year and he introduced Unity. And that was in that moment, like kind of the earth shifted on its axis a little bit because that was a point where the source of control and, and the source of truth went from being managed by the database to being managed by the governance engine. And that mm -hmm. meant that um, essentially that's when the six data platform that we've been yeah. talking about really took shape because you went from having one engine and any other tool having to go through that engine to get to the data to having the source of truth being defined in the catalog. And then, and then once you have open data formats, then any engine can talk to any data yeah. as long as they update the catalog. And now there's still a source of truth, but what, that, what happened was that Databricks went from being five years behind in DBMS technology to being many years ahead in catalog technology and where um, Snowflake open sourced the Polaris catalog for uh, a governance tool for iceberg tables. It's, it's just iceberg and it's just technical metadata whereas Unity is all your data assets even beyond uh, Delta and if they get iceberg working. So they basically, they changed the, the playing field so something that favored yeah. Snowflake to something that favored Databricks. Yeah. And uh, did you hear Ali on stage say, we're going to separate compute from the data, which has been the thesis yeah. of the Cube research, yeah. and yeah. two, he said, let the best engine win. Yes, right. I mean, that's a statement. Mm -hmm. He even said, don't give your data to vendors, including Databricks. Yeah. What does that mean? Like, I mean, he's up there saying, he's a vendor. He's saying, don't give us your data. What is, it, what is, he, what is he saying? By, by tilting the playing field away from the database to the governance catalog, all the tools still need to know something about the data. And that's, if, if it's their catalog, then their tools and engines are advantaged because that's, what's def that's what the catalog defines. So if someone else comes along with a catalog but they can't really establish it, their tools and engines are disadvantaged. That's where he's trying to create his tilt the playing field yeah. and his advantage. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I mean, they did you know, announce the open sourcing of Unity and I, I think that with their their claim would be that, hey, we, it is open source now. Like it's available now versus Polaris, which is coming to be open source in the near future. Mm -hmm. And I, I think they're looking at it going, hey, 
we need to lean into this open in a big way, yeah. and we need to tilt the field around that and build the ecosystem. And I, I think that will be the interesting thing to track this week is the ecosystem with these announcements as they move up stack into that away from the data. What's your assessment of the ecosystem? Because he brought that up on stage, Ali yeah. did. He said, hey, this is the key to our success. Obviously we're open source. What do you think, how do you view the, how would you grade the ecosystem? I think there's a lot of people who look at and believe what Ali is saying around, hey, stick the USB key that's the compute engine into the data and use whatever USB key you want to use to and compute on the data. We'll win sometimes, other people will lose sometimes and we'll lose sometimes and all of that stuff. I think what he's saying there and what you see in the ecosystem is that there are going to be people who have more than one engine. There's going to be people who need to bridge these engines. They may not use Unity or Polaris in the open source form across those different engines. So there is still an ecosystem play about connecting all of these different engines and where the compute happens together. So do you guys see, um, not to get technical for a second, but on the fragmentation of the data estates, he brought that up as a big problem. The data lake was supposed to solve that problem, but it's still a problem. So does that ever go away? You know, that's a great question. And the answer is, there's, it's like Maslow's hierarchy, only instead of like human enlightenment, it's sort of like <laughs> data harmonization. And you know, first you gotta, you gotta rationalize yeah. the delta format and the iceberg format. That's like basic food and shelter. And then there's a layer above that, which is what Unity is trying to do, yeah. where you know, you're, you're tracking the lineage and the quality, but there's a layer still above that, which is the semantic harmonization, where the, 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 the data means the same thing, because right now, the data, the, what the data really means is trapped in, the, in all the silos of the applications it comes from, and there's a lot of work to be done to harmonize that. So, so freeing the data up is one thing, that's the low level, yeah. and then harmonization is kind of like the self actualization Yes, self actualization <laughs> Where's Wi-Fi this, fit in that? This, this just got deep, man, these metaphors, like, this yeah. is a philosophy <laughs> lesson at the same time. I, I love it, gentlemen, it's great. It's a, it's well, great. I mean, this is going to be interesting, Savannah, because what happens is, is that if it doesn't harmonize, then it's going to be a food fight between vendors, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's going to, and we saw that play out in other uh, industry ways, like back in the old mini computer days, you had network operating systems were proprietary, each vendor had their own thing. Of course, no. TCP IP, the OSI model, solved that and created, changed the industry. So to me, I think this data model, Rob, we talked about on theCUBE before, yeah. if this standard happens, the tooling changes, everything changes. So the question is, where are the two, where's the, what's the focus now on the picks and shovels? Is right. it still fixing the old stuff, or are there net new tools coming? Yeah, well, I, I think that what's interesting, and you're going to have a number of really great guests who can talk to this on, on, over the next two days, that are in the ecosystem, that are bringing harmonized data from multiple different places, like Fivetran, into a data lake, or a, data, a delta lake, or what have you, and then it's being transformed and used for recommendations engines and brought out to some of the other ecosystem yeah. that's out there. To again, what you were talking about, solve some of these use cases, yeah. because people aren't building, and I think they even talked about this whole agent approach to AI, and I think that, that to me was the strongest part of their discussion was, because we talk about intelligent data apps all yeah, the time, yeah, yeah. and that's where the agents really plays. You have an agent that does an activity, it's a, pro, it's a actually a data feature of a data product. And I think that they're, they're really going that, but to that point, yeah. if you don't have that base layer figured out, so you're... Re really quickly, to build on what you said, the agents, the agents have to operate um, by having some sort of consistency in knowing what a tool does, what the data does. And what, what I think sometimes we lose sight of is the data is now the programming interface to the real world. And that's why you need that semantic harmonization. Because it's, it's, the data is a representation of the people, places, things, and processes in your business. That has to be harmonized so that the agents can um, pick, at, um, pick at a people and resources and activities, apply tools to orchestrate them. That's what we're moving towards. One quick thing before we break, I know we're tight on time. The 100% serverless announcement was huge. Now, I, I jumped out of me because yeah. I just wrote a post about the Hadoop ecosystem might look like the AI system, it might crash and burn, a lot of complexity. Yeah. Because Hadoop failed because it was so hard to manage and getting people to tinker with it. Yeah. The cluster management, it was a nightmare. And Spark kind of solved that, the leaks came in. Does that solve the friction problem, guys? 
what does that mean? I mean, I think it's a big deal. Well, there's always needs. complexity, but the Hadoop, yeah. the Hadoop complexity was, was crushing because all the components were different, were essentially different open source projects, and they were all on-prem. So you had the, the triple, the exponential difficulty of trying to stitch them all together and that they were on-prem. Now the complexity is at the data harmonization layer. Yeah, and I, I think it does help for those people trying to get into it, right? I mean, if you're try, just getting into Databricks, absolutely lowers the barrier to entry. I think for the ones that like to turn the knobs and like to do the coding as we were talking about, they may stay with classic Databricks as long as they can because they feel like they can optimize their AWS, Google, or Azure infrastructure at an instance level better than they have and they lose control yeah, at yeah. the serverless and I'm betting on the AI to save me money, time. Is that an cost. operational issue or just more of comfort? I think it's a comfort, <laughs> I think it's a comfort issue. I, I definitely <laughs> think it's a, I, I like my pets as we were talking yeah. about and I, you know, I want to hold them. Do you have pet, yeah, pet, play with them. Wow, pet, my toys. Pets. pets, harmony, coconuts, all things I wasn't expecting to talk about this morning, but that's exactly why our coverage this week is going to be so fantastic. George, Rob, and John, thank you so much for joining me for the next two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage here in San Francisco, California. We, my name is Savannah Peterson. We're at Databricks Data and AI Summit. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news. Cheers.